We must see Jesus. We were made to behold him. His life, not in general, but in a thousand specific ways, must become our vision. The Lord is good that he drew you to be with us today in this virtual worship service. I'm Pastor Rick Stumer here at Tunnel and Warren Chapel United Methodist Churches. And today we'll be looking at a pivotal point of the kingdom of God, the ascension of Jesus Christ. It is the domino that sets the whole topple into motion, if you will. It sets in motion the power of God and the post-Easter world. Today, we're going to explore this first domino of Jesus Christ as the risen and ascended God in whom the fullness of God dwells. It's topple time! Praise the Lord! Praise God in the sanctuary! Worship God in the mighty firmament! Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise God with trumpets and horns. Worship God with a lute and harp. Let the people of God sing their praise. Praise God with tambourine and dance. Worship God with strings and pipes. Let the faithful join the strain. Praise God with clashing cymbals. Praise God with beating drums. Praise the Lord. Eternal God, who was and is and is to come, you are the Alpha and the Omega, the, the beginning and the end of all things. Come to us now in visions and dreams. 
that our eyes may see more than they see and our hearts may love more than they love. Make yourself known to us in this time of worship. For in you we live and move and have our being. Bring your kingdom here on earth that all may know your glory and find the courage to face each day. We ask this in the name of the one who conquered the grave to bring us eternal life. Amen and amen. Our gospel reading today comes from John chapter 20 verses 19 through 31. Now hear these words. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord! But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and I put my fingers in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. And a week later, the disciples again were in the house, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for all people. Thanks be to God. Hi, kids! I have a story to tell you today, but first, who can remember to tell me what last Sunday was? Yes, it was Easter. And what do we remember happened on Easter morning? Oh, yes, it was when some of Jesus' friends went to the cemetery to visit his grave, and yeah, they found out he wasn't there anymore. He was risen from the grave. That was pretty cool, wasn't it? Well, now I want to tell you a story about what happened next. The story says that on the day after Easter, when a bunch of Jesus' friends were all together talking about what had happened, guess who walked in the door and said hi to them? Yeah, it was Jesus. And I bet that got everyone pretty excited, don't you? Yeah. And Jesus, after Jesus left them, they were talking about what happened. And, and when Thomas came in, they called him Thomas, but, but we'll just call him Tom. Anyway, they told Tom about Jesus coming to see them, but Tom just didn't believe them. He said, unless I can see for myself and, and touch him myself, I'm just not going to believe you. And they tried to convince him that Jesus was alive, but he wouldn't believe them until he saw Jesus for himself. You know, I think I know how Tom was feeling. I have to admit that sometimes when I'm having problems or not feeling well or I'm feeling kind of afraid, I wonder if Jesus is really still here too. Have you ever felt that way? That you wish you could see Jesus for yourself? Yeah, I think that all of us feel that way sometimes. Well, I have a surprise for you. I have an actual photograph of Jesus right here. 
It's not a drawing. It's not a painting, but something that will show you what Jesus looks like today, right now. Would you like to see it? Oh, you would. Okay. I'm going to show it to you here all in just a minute, but uh, let's see the picture of yourself. And uh, so here, come on, come on. Let's, let's see my picture of Jesus. Isn't that cool? I heard some of you say it wasn't a picture of Jesus, but it's just a plain blank piece of paper. Did you think that? Well, okay. I did play a trick on you. I did it because you don't need me to show you a picture of Jesus. You already know what Jesus looks like today because you've already met him face to face. When? Can you remember a time when you were really afraid of something or maybe a time when you were really sick or maybe a time when you fell down and got really hurt? Can you remember a time like that? Okay. And can you remember the person who came to help you when that happened? Maybe it was someone in your family or maybe a neighbor or Maybe a nurse or a doctor, or maybe it's someone you don't even know, but they came and took care of you to help you feel better. Can you remember a person like that? Can you remember what they looked like? Their face? Well, guess what? That was Jesus you saw. Anytime someone stops to care for someone else, Jesus is with them. And when we look at that caring person, we see Jesus. Do you remember that person who took care of you? Do you remember their eyes and how they looked at you? Do you remember how they talked to you and tried to make you feel better? They were helping you like Jesus would help you. So they were being Jesus for you. And if you can remember that person's face, then you know what Jesus looks like. In that story about Tom we were talking about and, and Tom saying he would not believe unless he saw Jesus and actually got to touch him for himself. Well, the story says that a week later, Jesus came back and, and Tom got to see him and then he believed. But Jesus said something really important. He said, it was great that Tom believed in him now, but it was really more special when people could believe in Jesus without making him drop whatever he was doing to prove to someone that he was real. And Jesus said, if we want to follow him, we need to stop and take care of those people around us who need help. And when we do that, we're acting like Jesus would act. We are being Jesus for that person. So if you're ever afraid or sick or hurt and you really want to know what God, if God is around, look at the people who come to take care of you. They are doing what Jesus would do. They are being Jesus. Let's pray and ask God to help us remember. Dear God, thank you for reminding us how much you love us. Please help us to remember that you love all the people that you have ever created and help us let the people around us know that we love them just like Jesus loves us. Amen and amen. And it was great to have you with us and with me this morning, kids. And I look forward to seeing you either virtually next week or in person. But until then, may God bless you during this week. Till
do you know that Jesus wants to hear your voice? He wants us to come together and spend time with him. And we're going to do that in just a moment. And when we come together, we can pray together or corporately, but we can all pray individually as well, touching on some of the same things and, and also those concerns that are on our hearts. And sometimes it's good to bring others alongside of us for those prayers, lifting those things up that are hard on our hearts and heavy on our hearts up to God. And while we're virtually gathered here, I can't see your hand raise and ask you uh, to share your concerns. So I'm going to ask you to do the next best thing. Pull out your phone, pull it out and call up your texting program and text me at 740-304-5133. And when you text me at 740-304-5133, I will read that prayer concern. I will pray with you and for you, and I will keep it between you and me and God and whomever else you share it with, unless you say, I want your prayer warriors at Tunnel and Warren Chapel to be praying for me as well. And if you ask that, I will share it with them and they will pray with you and for you as well. And if you don't have the ability to text, you can email me. You can email me at pastorrick at tunnelumc.org. Again, that's pastorrick at tunnelumc.org. And when I receive that email again, I will pray with you and for you. I'll share it with our prayer warriors if you request it. Otherwise, it will remain confidential between me, you, and God, and whomever else you asked to pray with you for that concern. So let us now go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, we come today reminded of your greatness and glory, your sovereign power and eternal purpose, and that's all expressed so wonderfully in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Risen and ascended Lord, we thank you for the wonder of ascension that marvelous yet mysterious moment in the life of the apostles, which left them gazing heavenwards and in confusion, yet departing in joy. We thank you for the way that it brought the earthly ministry of Jesus to a, a fitting conclusion, signifying his oneness with you and demonstrating your final seal of approval on all that he had done here on earth while he was here. We also thank you that through his ascension, Jesus is now set free to be Lord of all. He's no longer bound to a particular place or a time. But he is with us always, able to reach even to the ends of the earth as he empowers us to do ministry. We thank you that through his departing, Jesus prepared for his coming again through his spirit, through his church, and his coming again in glory. Gracious God, forgive us for so often failing to grasp the wonder of ascension, for living each day as though it had never been. Forgive the smallness of our vision the narrowness of our outlook, the, the weakness of our love, the, the nervousness of our witness, our repeated failure to recognize the fullness of your revelation in Jesus Christ. Give us a deeper sense of wonder, a stronger faith, a, a greater understanding of all that you have done. And now we pause just a moment in, in silence for us to lift up those concerns on our hearts. Hear us, O oh Lord. And now, Father God, like the apostles, we too will never understand all ascension means. We accept it, but we do not fully understand. We believe, yet we have so many questions. 
help us despite our uncertainty to to hold firm to the greatest truth that the wonder of Jesus Christ goes far beyond anything that we can ever imagine. And that in faith, we may live each day to your glory and to your honor. All these things we ask in the name of the one who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Have you ever played with dominoes? No, I don't. didn't ask if you'd ever played dominoes. I know some of you like to match up the five with the five and, the, and do all these Mexican chains and stuff like that. Uh, uh, Mexican train. Uh, those are fun games and I enjoy those. But uh, I want to know if you have you ever stacked dominoes, uh, standing them on end and, uh, and one next to the other and arrange them in some kind of circle or design in order to tip the first one and hopefully begin the chain reaction of the next one falling and the next one and then the next there's a new tv show on fox that encourages that and it's entitled domino masters and this next week will be their finals or semi-finals and here we are on april 24th that's when this is going to be airing it and in this competition on fox uh Teams of three or four people are given 16 hours to, to play with dominoes and create topples that use certain techniques and tell a story around a theme. And the teams are scored on their techniques, their tricks, their storytelling, and of course their topple. And the show can drag some in the build stage, but the topples are, are worth the wait. And I find myself rooting for everything to work work in, in each one of the topples and, and for every domino to fall. What took 16 hours to design and build takes just minutes to, to tip and fall. It's cool to watch, but it can get old quickly. For too many of us, and for too long, the Bible has been like a boneyard of flat dominoes. We've done our best to play around with them, but they've never come into alignment with the powerful effects of the Holy Spirit, nor have our lives come into the alignment Jesus intends for the supernatural entity he referred to as my church in Matthew 16, 18. I fear that the present day church, which is a reflection of present day Christians, has become something of an exercise in domino tipping. Enormous amounts of time are spent arranging our programs, our classes, and our events, just as we did them last year and or at least pre-COVID, and the dominoes tip and they fall predictably in an order like clockwork. We expect them to impress others and impress ourselves, and they do for a little while. But if we are honest, we must admit to uh, being a little bored with it all. Surely this is not what Jesus envisioned when he spoke of building his church on the rock and the gates of hell not prevailing against it. And during the builds on Domino Masters, almost everyone uses what is commonly called the domino effect, which we'll see in action in a moment. And then there's something altogether different that I consider to be the real domino effect, which is what we are going to be exploring today and over the next five weeks from the book of Colossians. The physical world domino effect is the way a two-inch tall domino can tip into and topple over a four and a half inch tall domino and then a four and a half inch tall domino can topple a domino just over a foot tall and and that one can topple a domino that's two and a half foot tall which we see illustrated in this video
was cool, wasn't it? And it doesn't stop there. There's real power here because when you get to the 23rd domino in this progression, you've just toppled the Eiffel Tower. And when you come to the 31st domino, you've just knocked over something 3,000 feet taller than Mount Everest. And it all started with one two inch tall domino. And if you could keep building it at, at domino number 57, you would be approaching the moon. That just blows me away at the power that just one small, seemingly insignificant action can have and that God built it into his created physical world for us to sense and to experience. And then to think that these physical effects most likely hold true in all of God's creation, even in the spiritual realm. And if you doubt that, remember that what Jesus said during the Last Supper in John's Gospel? Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, will do greater works than these, because I'm going to the Father. Think of this in terms of the domino effect. Jesus, in effect, is saying that Jesus' ascension starts in motion, the greater things that God wants to do in and through his followers. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll hear more, more about that as we move through Colossians. First, we need to fully realize who Jesus is, and, and we'll do that by looking at our creed or our memory verse for this series, and it's our text for today. So let's say it together. Let's read it together now as we, as we hear and listen to our own voices reading Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20, off of the screen that's in front of you. Ready, set, go. He is the image of the visible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. We'll be reciting this each week, and I want to encourage you to read it each day during the series. And, and when you read it, don't just read it silently. Read it out loud. Let it sink in and, and become a part of who and whose you are. Focusing on this passage daily for the remaining days of the 50 great days of Easter will help you and each one of us see, really see Jesus. As J.D. Walt ver er, writes in our devotional on the domino effect, we must see Jesus. We were made to behold him, his life, not in general, but in a thousand specific ways, must become our vision, his pre-existence, pre-eminence, conception, birth, life, words, deeds, miracles, relationships, signs, sermons, parables, prayers, suffering, passion, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, return, and eternal reign must become our holy obsession. We know that Jesus is God, but do we know that God is Jesus? That's what Jay-Z asked us. Ask us. That's the first thing that we must realize. And Paul here in Colossians makes it abundantly clear who Jesus is. Jesus is the center of all that is and was and ever shall be. He fills today's passage full of declarations about Jesus. He's the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. In him all things in heaven and earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, 
so that he might come to have first place in everything. Paul declares, it's all Jesus. Everything, it's all Jesus. The evangelist who married Dolores and I nearly 37 years ago always stopped and exclaimed, it's Jesus. Every time he sensed God's presence or Holy Spirit power while he was preaching. And that's what Paul was saying. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. Yes, as United Methodist Christians, we are Trinitarian in our beliefs, but that means we believe in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but we are Christians, which means we follow Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus, Messiah, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the center of all we are or to use a big fancy theological word, we are Christocentric, which just means that we are Christ-centered. Uh, we know the Father because we know Jesus. We know the Holy Spirit because we know Jesus. We read the Bible because we know Jesus. And that's what's going on here in Colossians chapter 1, 15 through 20. And indeed, the whole New Testament. In fact, the whole Bible is a book about Jesus. The Old Testament is his backstory. The Gospels are his life story. The rest is his ongoing story and future story, which includes some of those greater things that Jesus promised would happen. I'm not sure if you're following the devotional and looking at it each day. And it's such a vital part of this series. And you can find it on our Facebook page or on Seabed Ministries daily text emails. But I, I encourage to, you to do so if you aren't. J.D. Walt does a great job with these. Yesterday's focus was on verses 19 through 20 of today's reading. And before we look in depth at that, let's do what J.D. suggested and stop and slowly say aloud the 12 words that composed Colossians 1.19. Okay, let's do it together. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Say it again. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. J.D. shares... Does this strike to you as a bit of redundancy to say all his fullness? Doesn't the word fullness imply all? What's going on here? Uh, the Greek word is pronounced pleroma, which means something like perfect completion on the one hand, and on the other hand, superabundance. It carries both the ideas of quality of fullness and, and quantity of fullness. Every bit of God of the universe, both in terms of the qualities of God and the sheer quantity of God, lives in Jesus Christ. Paul wants us to grasp the ungraspable. It's as if he's saying extra complete because it would seem impossible for God to contain, be, to be contained in a human being. Paul's inspired to make the point even stronger. Here, Paul is saying the fullness of God dwelled in the human Jesus. I know this is mind-blowing. Now I want you to look at the person next to you. Just look over at them. Whether you're at home or not, or if you're by yourself, look in the mirror or in the reflection in the screen. And look at the humanness of that person. And now imagine and, and try to wrap your head around that mind-blowing idea that God became a person just like the person you're looking at. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? But God is able to do far more than we can ever think of or imagine. And J.D. writes, God is a human being. We don't struggle so much with God as a divine being, but when it comes down to it, we struggle with God as a human being sometimes deep in all of us. We want to escape being human. We want to be superhuman, hence our fascination with superheroes. What we want, though, we won't, won't admit it, is to be gods. We want to be in control, to, to be the masters of our own destiny and the, the destiny of others. We don't want to be more and greater and better. We want to be the most and the greatest and the best. We want to be sovereign. We want to be in control. We want the power. And that's what we see sovereignty as 
while God sees it and manifests it as the power of love. And then we're in a quandary there because we don't comprehend the true what true love is because of our human fallenness. However, we see revealed in Jesus the pure nature of sovereignty as holy love. And this is why we must truly see Jesus for who he is, the human in whom the fullness of God dwells. What if God would be pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in us? in you and me. And that brings us to verse 20, where Paul concludes, and through him, Jesus, to reconcile himself, God, all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. In other words, he came to rescue us, to redeem us, and to completely revolutionize us, not just as persons, but as a people. Paul writes about this in several of his letters. One familiar place is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 21, where he wrote, For the love of Christ urges us on, because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all, so that those who might live no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ Jesus, or in Christ Jesus, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on the behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So let me ask you a question. And I want you to be honest. You don't have to answer me. But this is between you and me. Or between you and God, not you and me, but you and God. Are you reconciled to God? Are you becoming a new creation? This question is easy for those of you who were outright living away from God and then God rescued you from totally depraved life. We love to hear those rescue stories and and rejoice over what God did in those persons' lives. But for many of us, we were raised in church and and kept on the straight and narrow road and, and think that this doesn't apply to me. We think, I don't need to be rescued. I'm good right where I'm at. I don't need to be reconciled. Uh, And if you're there, I'm praying for you. I began praying for you and others like you since I went on my first Emmaus walk long ago. And as we prayed in the chapel during that weekend, a certain section of the prayer stood out as the spiritual director prayed for those that were on the walk and especially for those who think they need it the least. Maybe those words stood out to me because they resonated with where I came from. I grew up in church. I got straight A's. I was a Boy Scout. I was active in Malay. I was thought to be a narc in high school just because I was such a goody-good shoes, because I was the clean-cut American boy with a Richie Cunningham goody two-shoes reputation. I was the good Christian boy and the role model for others. I feel sorry for my sister because I set such high expectations for her. And I could do and be anything that I wanted to. But inside, inside, there were attitudes that didn't show in my actions towards others. There were these lurking attitudes in the recesses of my mind and in and the biggest of these was thinking that I didn't need to be rescued from anything. 
And yet that attitude of self-sufficiency and blossoming pride was the various very thing that needed to be res I needed to be rescued from. Perhaps that's why I spent so much time studying Jesus' words uh, about those following him needing to deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow after Jesus. I learned it's not about me. It's all about Jesus. It's not what I can do, but it's what Jesus can do through me. And when I humbled myself and realized that I couldn't be the person Jesus wanted me to be without him, then I was reconciled to Jesus. In fact, I wouldn't be standing here before you today without him. We all need Jesus. And we all need to be reconciled in him in order to be freed to be the person that God calls each of us to be. So let me ask you again. And you're answering this before God and in your conversation with God. Are you reconciled to God? What's holding you back? Is it your pride? Is it thinking that you need it the least? You don't need rescued? Or maybe you just don't want to be changed? You see, Jesus came so that humanity could be reconciled to God, whether the vilest of sinners or the church-raised sinner. He wants us all to experience what Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. And you who were once estranged, that's every one of us, and hostile in mind, again, that's all of us, doing evil deeds. Those evil deeds may not have been acted out in the flesh and in the, in our, through our bodies, but they were happening in our minds. And he has now reconciled his fleshly body through death so to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, provided that you continue securely established and steadfast in the faith without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel. So that's reconciliation. And next week, we'll look at domino number two, Christ Jesus and me. He hasn't just reconciled you to himself. He is in you, each one of you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming as a human like us and showing us God in human form. Forgive us for our sinfulness especially when we think we need you the least or not at all. Rescue us, whether we are hell-raising sinners or church-raised sinners. We need you. Make us holy and blameless and above reproach as you come to dwell in each of us. Help each of us to truly see you Lord Jesus, amen and amen. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night Waking or sleeping Thy presence my life Be Thou my wisdom and Thou my truth
prayed a few minutes ago, and I confess for us and pray that uh, you prayed along with me, but uh, let us now join together our voices in unison. We, While we claim to celebrate the ascension of our Lord, the, the way we live proclaims our lack of faith and his power to deal with the world. Let us conve- confess the incongruity between our faith and practice. So let us pray. We come, O oh Lord on this day of glory to confess our lack of trust. While we sing of your lordship over all creation, we have too often acted as though you are powerless in the face of today's events. Help us to live with confidence in your presence today and in hope for life with you forever. Amen and amen. In the description of this video, there's a link to be able to give to the ministries here at Tunnel and Warren Chapel. And as we contemplate and prepare for the ending of this service, let us be generous in our giving that others may see in us the transforming power of God. Let us be lavish in our gifts that others may draw life from the bounty of God's blessings. Now let us pray for those gifts that we are about to give. Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, you are the source of every blessing. We behold your glory in the skies and and touch your mystery all around us. 
in the beauty of our awakening, our doubts give way to a deep and abiding joy. In gratitude for your many mercies, we offer you these gifts and offerings that they may be signs of our commitment to live as your faithful disciples. Amen and amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Air of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit. Washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song. Raising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. May God grant you spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may be able to see things from a spiritual point of view, and so that your lives may be worthy of God and pleasing to Him. And may you bear fruit in all that you do and continue to grow in your understanding of 
who God is, that you may see Jesus clearly, and may God give you the strength you need to endure whatever comes with patience and even joy, always giving thanks to God through Jesus Christ, who has given you new life. Go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Praise your mind.